Hello everyone, I'm James Turk, and it's a pleasure to be here today with Adam Fleming, the chairman of Wits Gold. You know, Adam, there's so much going on in the markets. Um, the euro is fraying at the edges. Uh, the gold price took a hit over the past few weeks. Let's start by talking about gold. What's your view on the gold price, and maybe have we hit a bottom here with the big move yesterday back up? I think it's very likely that we have. Um, the, the subject of the gold price uh, is uh, always a little bit emotional because it's something that uh, James, you and I have followed for many years, mm -hmm. both of us believing that uh, in due course it will become apparent to everyone that uh, gold is the only money that uh, politicians can't print. And uh, as we all know, we talk gaily about quantitative easing, but actually at the end of the day it is printing fiat currency. And uh, gold has been money for 5,000 years. And for the, for the only time in that 5,000-year period, we've had this experiment since Nixon uh, unbacked uh, the dollar from gold. We've had this uh, experiment uh, in the last 30 or so, or so years where currencies have no connection with precious metals. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I believe that uh, this is all coming unwound uh, as we speak. And uh, the recent uh, pressure on gold um, has only been matched, actually, by also the, uh, the fall in the, in the gold shares. Um, and the reason I believe that gold is bottoming here is because the gold shares are trading at two standard deviations to the gold price. And this has only happened five times in the last hundred years. Um, in the crash in 2008, in 2000, in 1980, uh, in 19... Uh, I think way back in, 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 in 1950s and in the 30s. So I think we're at a, an extraordinary inflection point uh, with both gold and gold shares uh, providing really unusual opportunity. Yes. You know, we both spoke um, in August of 2005, as I recall, at Dawson City at the GATA conference that was there. And you were forecasting a price of approximately $3,000 an ounce. Keep in mind that you know, gold was $400 at the time. Yeah. We've come a long way. Uh, we're not too far from 3000 Are we still headed you know, higher in, in that direction? Well, you know, the gold price has gone up a lot since that time. Um, but actually, you may laugh, but I think gold is cheaper now than it was then. I'm I not laughing because I, I know where you're going with this. Yeah. <laughs> but it's I, value that matters, not price. I, th I think what has happened since then has taken, taken even inflationists uh, or people who see this inflation taking place like you and me by surprise. Mm -hmm. um, I sometimes say it's not the price of gold. Gold is the same, whether it's in the time of Christ or now. Mm -hmm. A piece of gold is a piece of gold. That's what's so amazing about it. Mm -hmm. um, what is happening though is that the currencies against which it is being measured are being uh, inflated substantially. And I like to look at a little metric that has held true over the last, uh, certainly the last century, and that is how many ounces of gold it takes to buy one unit of the, of the Dow Jones. And uh, at, at the peaks in the market, uh, like in 1928-9, like in 1966, like in 1980, oh, sorry, like in 1999, um, it's taken many, many ounces of gold to buy one unit of the Dow. Mm -hmm. But it always and always reverts to one uh, ounce of gold to buy one unit of the Dow. So yes. I believe sometime in the future you'll be able to buy one unit of the Dow Jones uh, for one ounce of gold. And whether the price, whether the Dow Jones is at 30000 and therefore it'll be $30,000 uh, 30, an ounce uh, that we'll that the price of gold would be trading at, or whether we go into massive deflation and the Dow is at 2000 and it's $2,000 an ounce. I believe that gold is real money and uh, will provide extraordinary opportunities Just to uh, put for some, those who see it. Put some numbers on this. In the 30s, uh, gold was 35 and the Dow Jones Industrials, believe it or not, was 34. Uh, in the eight, uh, 1980, it was 800 on gold and 800 on, Dow, uh, on, on the Dow. So at some point in time in the future, it's going to be 30,000 on each or 2,000 on each, but it basically doesn't matter in the sense that you're preserving your purchasing Correct. power for the foreseeable future until we hit that one-to-one -one ratio. Absolutely. And you're better off having the liquidity and also the avoidance of counterparty risk because you own a tangible asset, the value of which is not based on any one or any firm or any 
uh, company or any bank's promise or any government's promise. It's based on the market's perception that for 5,000 years gold's been money and for the foreseeable future it's going to remain money. James, I think you nailed it. And um, uh, there's one other interesting aspect I'd like to, to mention uh, to, your, to, your, um, to your viewers, and that is that um, Standard Chartered, which is a very substantial bank, um, and I know the people there very well, they have a, a very good um, uh, gold analytical group uh, in Hong Kong, and they published last year a piece of research called In Gold We Trust. And the reason I mention this is most uh, researchers look at the demand for gold, but they looked at the supply of gold going forward. Mm -hmm. Now, despite the fact that for the, for the last 11 years, gold has proved to be an outstanding asset class. It's compounded at between 15 and 20 percent in almost any currencies you like to mention per annum. Um, there have been no major new gold projects that have been started. So they looked at gold from a supply point of view, and for the next five years, the most optimistic prognosis they have, and this was after reviewing, as I say, 380 gold mining companies worldwide, the best prognosis they have is an increase in gold production of 3.5% a year for the next five years. As a result of that, and taking the demand side of gold, which, we, which they understand and, and subscribe to, uh, they see gold uh, going to $5,000. Now, that's from a very serious major bank. That's not a, yes. a small... Um, gold bug operation operating out of a, a niche market. So uh, I thought that's very significant. Is that perhaps because they have a good handle on what's happening in Hong Kong? You know, the gold inflows into China have been f uh, phenomenal over the past uh, um, several months, and particularly in the past quarter. It's getting up to Indian-type uh, numbers for demand. Well, um, uh, JP Morgan, which is a, a major bank that uh, us gold believers don't necessarily uh, uh, feel complete warmth towards actually is a major, major player in the gold market. And uh, I was talking uh, to someone who knows them well, and apparently recently demand for gold uh, 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 for, for JP Morgan to supply gold into Singapore, which is the main conduit into China for JP Morgan, has been astonishing. It has just been absolute amazing amounts of demand uh, for, the, for, the, for the physical metal and it disappears into China. So uh, quite clearly Chinese demand is ramping up rather like it started to ramp up in the iron ore, iron ore industry in, in, in the early 2000s. So mm -hmm. I, I believe we're in the foothills of a, of a very substantial secular bull market in, 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 the, in the precious metals. What's the driver in China? I, you know, I, as you know, I lived in Asia for most of the 70s, and you're also an old Asian hand as mm -hmm. well. Is it just the traditional cultural affinity toward gold, or is it other things? Is it inflation that's picking up, or is it just the fact that so much wealth is being created in China and gold flows to where the wealth is being created? Um, I, th I think it's probably a combination of all these things. I mean, in the West, we talk about gold uh, uh, almost sneeringly, uh, when, when uh, you raise the idea of gold as money, people say, well, actually, come on. But in our inner psyche, we still believe in gold. We talk about the golden opportunity, the golden chance, um, your gold credit card. You know, gold in the psyche of Westerners actually is a very valuable, beautiful, wonderful mm -hmm. Historical. We thing. learn it as children in exactly. fairy tales and things of that nature. But uh, if you go to the East, particularly, um, the East has lived through um, many iterations of uh, currencies and many different political systems. And anyone who's lived in China for the last uh, 50 years has seen extraordinary changes, uh, eradication of wealth, um, r things that you can't even be begin to, to dream about. So. Uh, it's that, I think, coupled with uh, their very strong historic belief in gold and also the administration, which I think is, is you know, is, is very um, shrewd. Uh, okay, they're saying uh, outwardly, because they don't want to rock the boat, they're saying, um, you know, we, we, have, we hold the dollar as one of our most substantial reserve positions. But what I think has been so brilliant is that they've they've gone to their, to their people and said, we would encourage you to save your money in the form of gold. And they've opened up this gold savings uh, route, uh, which 
really is in the best interests of their people. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's in a very enlightened view. And that is why I think it's real, genuine uh, demand from personal private savers that is driving, actually, the, the, the gold market in, in China. And when they're buying gold, the Chinese buy physical gold, obviously. They don't buy paper gold. Well, you know, uh, we can all talk about uh, gold in, in, in someone else's vault. I remember talking to a, a, a representative of the bank, Banque de France, um, in the early days of the, of, the, of the 2000s, when hedging was still considered to be uh, something that uh, every gold mining company should do. And central banks would lend out their gold for, they were, they were I would say, almost bamboozled into the belief that, uh, um, that lending their gold out for a pittance mm -hmm. uh, in terms of interest would be a, a good return uh, on their money. But the, the man at the Bank de France said to me, you lend your gold out, it's no longer gold. It's, it's uh, someone else's liability. Yeah. Gold is only uh, um, what it says on the tin if it's in your safe with the, the key to the safe in your pocket. Yeah, the uh, tangible the moment, asset. Exactly. The moment you hold a piece of paper that someone else is holding your gold, you've already now got another risk, which is that yeah. that person who's holding your gold will go bust and you won't return it. Yeah, you turn a tangible asset into a financial asset and the financial asset has counterparty risk. Uh, the other point that people make, which I really take issue with, is that, oh, well, gold is no good because gold does not uh, bear an interest. Well, actually, it does bear an interest, and for some reason it's called a lease rate. But no currency bears an interest unless you lend it out. If you have a dollar note in your hand, that's not bearing any interest. It's only when you lend it to someone else and they pay you interest on it that it, it becomes an interest-bearing yeah. piece of, of, of paper, just as gold is... Uh, is money and doesn't bear interest until you lend it out. Yeah. So gold is no different from any other currency, yeah. except you, governments can't print it. Yeah, you, you raise an interesting point about the lease rate. That's the politically correct term. You know, when gold was supposedly demonetized in 1971 by President Nixon, you could no longer call it interest because it wasn't supposed to be money anymore. So they yeah. came up with this term, you know, a lease rate rather yeah. than an actual interest rate. Because interest rates, you know, when you borrow and lend money, you're paying interest rates, and that's essentially what it is for gold. And gold has a natural interest rate, although obviously central banks can in influence the interest rate as well as they can the price as well. Mm. You know, we're sitting here in the, the beautiful island of Jersey, although it's not that nice a day today, but if it were clear, we could look over there and see the, uh, the, the coast of France. But, you know, the euro. Let's talk a little bit about the euro. Is it going to survive, or is it is it finished? Well, I'm in not its, a currency expert, current uh, James. You are, yeah. but um, it's never. I've never understood the euro experiment. I gather it was started off uh, after the war. People saying, you know, we must stop this perfectly enlightened uh, um, uh, idea that we must avoid wars ever re reoccurring on the mainland of Europe again, and we must have this. Uh, common currency and, and, and political union. Um, but um, I believe it is absolute madness to assume that, uh, that someone in Italy will have the same uh, economic or monetary view as someone in Germany, as someone in Ireland, as someone in Portugal. These are all nation states that have completely different cultures, different understandings, different ways of going about things. So mm. I believe it's an experiment that is doomed to fail. Mm. And, um, and therefore, uh, I just think it's a question of time. And although everyone talks about the calamity of the euro collapsing, we, you know, the sun comes up in the morning and goes down in the evening, just as it did when we had Deutschmarks and, and Drachmas. Mm. So I believe that if there was a clean start, that the Greeks would return to what they're good at, which is the, the, the world's best uh, shipping industry, the world's best ship owners, uh, most, uh, most uh, shrewd uh, operators of the shipping industry, uh, also a major tourist destination. People would flood back into, into Greece and Greece would, Greece's economy would take off just as we, we, we have seen in Iceland, just as we saw mm -hmm. in Argentina when they uh, had to make a new start. So uh, I think um, uh, politicians don't like change. And they don't like losing control, but I believe that it's inevitable that the euro will, uh, will uh, the, the euro experiment will fail. Are the politicians going to try propping it up, though, in your view, to make it? Oh, I'm sure to, we'll see know, to prolong the agony, you know, rather than admitting that it's. Oh, not I working. can only be cynical. Uh, there, I'm sure there will be um, an experiment on a scale unthought of of monetary printing to try and keep the thing together. Mm -hmm. um, how long that will last, I do not know. But all it will 
emphasize is that precious metals uh, are the haven uh, that I believe them to be. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I think that uh, it'll be possibly the driver of the next stage of the, of the bull market in, in the precious metals. Okay. Um, I know you're an expert on South Africa, and I've been waiting to ask you a couple questions about there. Wh when did you first actually you know, start uh, uh, investing and in, uh, really looking at South Africa and yeah. more generally Southern Africa yeah. in terms of the, yeah. the uh, investment opportunities? Uh, James, you know, I can't boast that my timing in life is always uh, the top. So I became a gold bull in 90, 1990, 10 years too early, mm -hmm. uh, before Gordon Brown managed to sell half of Britain's gold uh, <coughs> in 1999, 2000, which now I have to tell you is called the Brown Bottom because he managed <laughs> to hit the exact low of the gold price. Mm -hmm. But um, As, what an amazing thing to go down in history for, huh? The prudent man, mm -hmm. yes. Um, the, my little story is that I went out to South Africa in 91 to open the offices of, of, uh, of Robert Fleming, which at that time was the, was the family banking operation. And I got involved in the gold mining industry on my, my own behalf. And uh, throughout the 90s, and even to today, South Africa uh, was going through great change. And there were no shortage of people who said that it was going to end in disaster. And we had the elections in 95, which I remember the BBC uh, saying that was, it was bound to end in a revolution. Well, there was a revolution. It was a revolution of a wholly good kind. It was the most peaceful election you'd have seen. Um, when I first arrived in South Africa in 91, you could lie on the road between Pretoria and Johannesburg and smoke a cigarette, which was then politically okay to do, uh, between cars passing. I mean, hardly anyone owned a motor car in, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely no uh, economic ownership by the black community. Mm -hmm. um, uh, today, uh, the roads are gridlocked in South Africa. Um, it's, there's been enormous uh, economic, uh, um, uh, an um, enormous economic endowment uh, to the black community. They're now a nascent black middle class. Um, and all I could say to your viewers is just go for a holiday there and you will be hit by a, a wave of raw energy, particularly in Johannesburg, which also gets an extraordinarily bad press. I lived in Johannesburg with my family and children, they went to school there. We've never had any incidents, uh, no, no difficulties at all. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think what you have to understand with South Africa is that the, the ANC is a very broad church. Uh, I know many people in the ANC and I have a high regard for them. And uh, they've been going since 1913, so they're not a recent iteration. And they have, um, I would say, almost a naive desire to allow de debate on any subject uh, the subject of nationalization has recently come up with uh, nationalization of the mines. Nationalization of the mines with Julius Malema, uh, who was head of the ANC Youth League, uh, uh, strutting around talking about nationalization. Now, I can tell you, nationalization wasn't ever on the original charter of the ANC. It was never, ever policy. And it never, according to the Minister of Mines, will be policy. And yet, because this individual, who was a bit of a firebrand, was seen as a representative of a, of a part of the ANC. The press leapt on this as, you know, South Africa is going to nationalize everything and it's going to go the way of Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, they allowed him to have his say. He, he has then been completely removed from the, from the ANC. Uh, the Youth League now uh, have embraced uh, Halema Moplanti, who is the deputy president and a very highly regarded, moderate um, and wise individual. Um, the, um, you know, it's one thing after another. If it's not, uh, uh, you know, President Mandela um, re retiring as president, uh, that was going to cause disaster. Then uh, President Mbeki retiring as president, that was going to cause disaster. Then it was nationalization of the mines, that's going to cause disaster. Well, if it's not nationalization of the mines, it's something else. There is this tremendous um, endowment, I think, going right back to the old years of political isolation that the newspaper industry have of trying to pick on the negatives. The positives of this country is that it's had radical transformation. It's got a democratic, freely elected uh, um, um, a government. With it's a regular succession of presidents democratically absolutely. elected. And, and as far as the mining industry is concerned, the whole subject of black empowerment has been debated with industry. The taxation has been debated with industry. And I can tell you as a, as a gold miner, I, there are very few destinations in the world 
that have the same first world level of infrastructure, roads, electricity. There's been problems with electricity, but that has been, a plan has been made and, and it is now something that is being dealt with. Uh, water reticulation, uh, mining laws, uh, mining taxation, very, very clear. Okay, it may be, there may be periods of inefficiency, but all I can tell you is that compared to places uh, that are very far away from any infrastructure, uh, where you, you have to rely on uh, a political deal with a local headman, uh, where you've got uh, you know, no tarred roads, no electricity, you have to bring everything in. Uh, South Africa is an extraordinary destination. Mm -hmm. And remember the other point about South Africa. Uh, South Africa has produced 40% of all the gold that has ever been mined in this world. It is, as Saudi Arabia is to oil, South Africa is to gold. Now, uh, as, as Standard Chart had said, there's been no serious new gold developments anywhere in the world in the last, serious new developments in, 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 in the world in the last, uh, in the last decade. Um, for Newmont or Barrick, who have to f discover between six and eight million ounces a year just to keep their reserve static, it's, extra it's just unbelievable to me that at some point in the future, the world won't have to come back to the Witwatersrand, this enormous gold system that is a unique gold system. Yeah. where 50 percent of the remaining reserves in, uh, of gold in the world still exist. The known gold that exists underground, 50 percent of it is in South According Africa. to the U.S. Geological Survey, that is, that yeah. is where the, 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 the still the greatest depository of gold. And now um, uh, uh, Anglo-American are talking about uh, mining down to five kilometers. This is the world's largest underground uh, uh, um, mining operation. Um, the major uh, strides in mechanization are taking place. And, you know, if you go down to the Free State, where our little company has substantial res resources, I get stopped in the street by people saying, when are you going to start the new mine? You know, mm -hmm. this is a major political imperative. It's not nationalization. It's not taxation. Mm -hmm. It's jobs. That is really what South Africa needs to, to produce. And there is huge political, um, political emphasis on that, which is not being understood or picked up in, 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 in world press. So the key really is investment. And um, are they encouraging foreign investment? They are, but um, uh, inevitably um, they could do more. Um, mm -hmm. What is, to me, as a value investor, what to me is the key here is what do you pay for an ounce of gold in South Africa? And in, in Canada you pay $1,100 an ounce of resource of gold. Um, in Africa, you pay $400 an ounce of resource of gold. In South Africa, you pay $100 an ounce of gold. And companies like mine, Little Vitz Gold, you're paying $1 an ounce of gold. This is, people will look back, I think, on this and say so it was an extraordinary uh, opportunity for investors, yeah. both gold shares and also the South African gold majors. Yeah, I guess, you know, looking at it from the point of view, if you, know, you believe this 5,000 year history of gold as money um, is going to continue for the foreseeable future, and the fact that 50% of the unmined gold in the world is still in South Africa, the future of South Africa is going to be bright because somehow or another that gold is going to be mined, um, uh, and it will attract the investment and therefore create the jobs. Absolutely. Yeah. I really believe that. Well, Adam, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time, and best of luck with Wits Gold. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.